and Morning Connection Point. Why don't you stand and worship with us this morning? As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. So calm down, Spirit, when you Come on, 
church, we say this. We give you the highest praise. You deserve it all. You deserve it all. We give you the highest praise. You deserve it all. You deserve it all. I love that song. I love that song. And if you're if you're here today and you're singing that, man, I, I pray that God is still moving in your life in a way that you can just sing that joyfully. From heaven to earth, death can death brought to life. But but you might be here today, and, and you might not be able to sing that fully. Because maybe you're just not experiencing that Jesus has overcome in your life yet. 
Maybe there's a, a part of your life that you've been praying for, you've been hoping, you've been dreaming of, and yet you're just getting radio silence. What do you do with that? In Matthew 26, Jesus, right after he's with the disciples, right after the, the garden, he goes out into the garden and he's praying and he brings these disciples with him. And he's praying to the Father, he's, Father, if there's any way, if there's any way that you can take this cup of suffering from me, would you do it? But, but not, not my will, yours, yours be done. And then there's this pause before he gets back up and he goes to the disciples. And I just wonder, what happened in the pause? Like, did he hear from God? Did God speak directly to him? Did he, did he hear the reassurance that he was going to fulfill his purpose? Or, or was it just silent? Because he knew. He knew what his purpose was. He knew why he was here. My friends, if you're waiting on God and if you're hearing silence, I pray that you would continue to wait in it. And when God speaks to you, I pray that you would listen to him. And when God, when God moves, would you follow him? I want to encourage you here today that, that, that I want you to live as though everything, everything depends on him. Because I want to make sure that you reap the harvest that's on the other side of the hard thing that you're currently walking through right now. And so as we continue in this time of worship here together, let's collectively... Let's reap the harvest of what Jesus did on that next day when he went to the cross and he took on our shame like we just sang about and he overcame. So, so let's grab your communion elements. Let's take the bread here together and remember the body of Jesus there on the cross for us. And with the juice, let's remember Jesus' blood that he poured out freely for you and for me, take and drink. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you trusted in the Father's will, even to the point of death on a cross for us. Jesus, I pray that if, if there are people here right now people joining us online right now that are still in a waiting posture. I pray that you would be so, so present, that we would be reminded that we can put all of our trust in you because what you have done for us on the cross. Jesus, we love you, we love you, we love you. It's all in your name we pray. Amen. You can trust him this morning. Come to him as you are, fearfully and wonderfully made. He loves you. Thank you, Lord. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my footman in the fire. Time after time, born of his spirit, washed in his blood, and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. So I trust in God, my Savior.
too big for our God this morning. Just lay it down. Put your trust in him. Lord, we trust you. You make a way. Mm, we say, and I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I saw the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. So glad that you guys are here. Why don't you take a seat and check out the screen. Hey, Connection Point. Thank you for prioritizing worshiping with us today. We have two things coming up that we are really excited for. You may remember back in January, we offered our first marriage course, which was a huge success. We prayed and believed we would pilot this course with 25 couples and ended up having to close the event when we reached capacity at 200 couples, which was 400 people. Due to the overwhelming response, we are starting another course on April 10th. Head to cp.news to sign up today. Also, it is so hard to believe that spring is almost here and Easter is just two weeks away. Yes, that's correct, two weeks. We are so excited to offer Easter services on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at our Brownsburg location and on Sunday at Brownsburg, Avon, and Fishers. And if you're going to be out of town for spring break, make sure you join us online. As you make your Easter plans, don't forget to sign up to serve at one of our locations and select which service your family will attend. Easter is such a great opportunity to serve with your entire family or to try a new role that you've been curious about exploring. You can head to cp.news to sign up. Research has shown that most people are receptive to an invite to attend an Easter service. Who in your life is God nudging you to invite? Every year we see new faces at Connection Point and love hearing the stories how God used your invitation to change lives. You can grab invites in the lobby at any of our locations on your way out today. Thank you, Connection Point. Your ongoing generosity allows us to continue to create weekend experiences that engage people that don't know Christ. Now let's prepare our hearts for the Word of God. All right, welcome, welcome. Welcome over in Avon at Fishers. Welcome everybody online and here at Brownsburg. It's awesome to be together. I don't know if anyone's looked you in the eyes lately and told you that they love you. Don't worry, I'm not gonna. You don't have to panic, but... I do believe God brought you into this moment to tell you that He loves you. He sees you today. Wherever you are in your journey, if it's your first time ever in church, or if you've been coming for 50 years, God wants you to know today that He loves you. 
Uh, and our neighbors need this message so much. So that's why we're asking you to take one of those Easter invites. Invite anyone you know. We are surrounded by people who are going through difficulty and are hopeless, but they don't tell us that. And so what Easter is all about is giving people hope, uh, the real hope, the eternal hope of God, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, all things that can't be bought or earned otherwise. So uh, I've been out a couple of weeks working on the Easter message. I'm really excited for the whole service. If you're going to be out of town, try to catch that Thursday or Friday night before you leave town. Or as Denise mentioned, if you're out of town for spring break, join us online. And we just can't wait to see who God's going to bring to himself at Easter. Uh, two weeks after that, so four weeks from today, we'll kick off a series called Satisfied. This is going to be a seven-week study of one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's called Ecclesiastes. It's all about the meaning of life and really those uh, deeper needs that we're talking a little about in this series. But Ecclesiastes, you're going to love it. It's intellectually stimulating, emotionally engaging. Well, those of you who know me know I tend to get a little serious. In my household, my wife Mel is the one who brings the fun. She brings the laughter. And one of the ways she does that is she will text me, random funny videos throughout the week, and often when I'm really in Mr. Serious mode, I'll get one of these, and it'll just lighten my mood. This one, you, you might not find funny. It's my weird sense of humor. This is a kayaker getting into the water. For whatever reason, I was deep in thought. She sent this to me. I was seated in a public place with my headphones on. I watched it, and I just burst out laughing out loud, and then I was like, I'm going to keep watching this until I can get through it without laughing out loud. It took me four repetitions. I won't make you watch it four times, uh, but see if you find this kayaker uh, as funny as I did. Go ahead and take a look. Right? See, you get, you, this is the best service. You guys laugh the most. You got my own twisted sense of humor. I, I don't know about you, but I've had seasons of life where that's what my life looked like. The water was calm, but I was flailing. And that's actually what we're going to talk about today. How can you avoid living a tiny life? By this, what I mean is a life where you're trapped repeating the same little empty cycle, you're searching for something that's missing, you go all out for it, you wear yourself out, and then you recover and then you do it again. Now, this is actually how most people live. And it's a gift to be able to step back from your life and even have the wisdom to acknowledge, oh, that's why I'm so hungry for success, or that's why I'm so hungry for emotional connection, uh, to realize that there's these deeper needs, but we all have them. And I want to share with you a true story from my life of a time when this relentless cycle of doing everything I could to meet my deeper needs, it just left me exhausted and exasperated. Those of you who've been here for a while, you've heard parts of this, but I think if you listen in, you're going to hear it go a little bit deeper today. When I was 21, I finished my undergrad degree in journalism. And my goal was to be the best in the nation at what I did. I had no idea what was motivating me to be the best in the nation. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with success and being motivated. But I would come to learn over the decade that there were some pretty deep, broken motivations in me. I didn't learn that till my 30s. But when I was 21, I started my journalism career, and that was my goal. There was a specific kind of long-form story that I wrote, and I wanted to be the best in the nation at it. At age 26, I was actually named that, and Charles Gibson from ABC News Tom Brokaw, a number of other kind of media elites, if you will, invited me out to the Manhattan Club in, uh, the Yale Club actually in Manhattan, to receive this award that is literally, you're the best person in the country at this under the age of 35. Now, at that time, I had come into a relationship with God. I had been leading Bible studies. I was starting to go to seminary kind of as a hobby because I'm a nerd. And I knew that there was something a little broken in me about how hungry I was for approval and accolades and success. I, I didn't really know what it was, but I knew there was something not quite right. Well, when we were there, I had just a few months earlier committed to a church of 40 people in Arizona that I would walk away from my journalism career and become their pastor, and that's what I did. And I thought I was giving up all of that kind of uh, relentless pursuit for self and success because I was going to be a pastor. So I thought. 
Three years later, I had been a faithful pastor. I was reading the Bible every day. I was teaching on the weekends. I was doing my best to be a good dad and a good husband. But there was a book publisher that had asked me to write a book, and so I did. And when it came out, I got uh, an email from my agent who said something about bestseller. I, I didn't even know, like bestseller lists, all this stuff. So I looked it up, and I remember seeing this screenshot here uh, that my book was in the top 100. It was next to this book called Black Hawk Down, if you've seen that movie. And it was this moment I had like kind of given all that up, the whole national whatever, and all of a sudden it like came back to life in me. And I was like, wow, I'm the best in the nation at something. Next day I looked and there it was in the book below. It was by a guy named Henry Kissinger. He's kind of a big deal. Then the New York Times asked me to write for them about it, and I remember getting that edition of the New York Times and looking on the front page and like, wow, there's my name on the front page of the New York Times. If you're a writer, that's kind of a big deal. Then CNN asked me to write for them, so I wrote for them, and then I was new to this pastor world thing. If you're not a pastor, you might not know these names, but in the pastor world, there was this guy, Andy Stanley, and he tweeted my CNN article and said, way to go, John. And I was like, wow, this is awesome. Then his buddy Dave Ramsey tweeted the same thing. And then I walked into a Barnes and Noble and it's like, wow, there's my book. That happened. And, and what, what started off with good motives and good intent became this daily addiction of checking the numbers. Where am I on the bestseller list? Who's talking about me today? What started off well took me right back to where I was three years ago. Now, I was still reading my Bible every day. I was still right with God. I wasn't sinning, but there was just something in me that kept going back to this need for approval from people. It took me a number of years to work through it. I'll share with you some of that today. Here's a screenshot from the last day that I ever looked at the bestseller list. There's my book below. It's a book called Jesus Calling, a book called Love Does by Bob Goff, and then ironically, a book by Jenny Allen called Nothing to Prove. But I hadn't yet learned that in my life. I spent a year in a nonstop adrenaline rush checking all these numbers and bestseller lists, and I would have these highs of these big time people mentioning me, and then these lows of the next week. Well, why didn't anyone mention it this week? And we had Jack at home. He was little. I was flying, crisscrossing the country to go speak different places, writing nonstop for everyone who asked. And instead of feeling fulfilled by becoming the best in the nation at something, instead, that rush, that constant effort for approval left me feeling increasingly like this guy. Water in my mouth, water up my nose. I was so empty, I was so depleted, and three years later, I was right back where I said I wasn't ever going to go again. Starting at age 30 to see a pattern, but still not seeing it very clear. I remember telling my wife, Mel, I had worked as a Starbucks barista in college, and I remember telling her one year into all that, I was like, babe, I am so depressed and exhausted, I would rather be a Starbucks barista than all this success. Like, it's just killing me. And I never would have thought that from the outside. And what I didn't realize, and God would reveal to me over the next few years, is that there were deep, unmet needs in me that I was looking to have those met through my success. I never would have said it this way, but now, about 10 years later, looking back, I can see that this is one of the things that was going on in my mind. I'm not seen. That's a family of origin thing for me. My family, they're, they're good people. They just, ne they just don't ever check in. You know, they don't call you on your birthday or any day. And as a youngest who was kind of an accident, you just kind of get this impression like I'm not seen. I never would have said that in my 20s when I was going after all this approval and success. But I think something going on in my heart was this. I'm not seen. So maybe if I become the best in the nation at something. Or for some of you, if you're kind of an achiever, it's maybe like, I'm not seen, so maybe if I'm, I get super successful, then I'll be seen. Turned out my family didn't care. <laughs> they didn't care about best-selling books. They didn't care about national journalism awards. 
The same people who didn't call me on my birthday before all those things also didn't call me on my birthday or any day after those things. It didn't change them. It didn't meet that deep need that I had. And I started to realize, though I still didn't have clarity about all that was motivating me, I started to realize there's some deep things in me that are motivating me that if I don't somehow get those to God, not just be a Christian and know the Bible and kind of believe in God, but if I don't get my deepest needs to God, I'm going to spend the rest of my life on earth in this tiny cycle, exhausting myself to try to grasp at something that really is impossible to grab, only God can give. Here's another childhood wound that was driving me. I didn't know it. I almost did state this one this way all through my 20s. For whatever reason, you know, I always felt like I had zero safety net to fall back on. Well, it was true, I guess, is why I felt that way. And so I remember telling Mel, even in our 20s, I'm, like, I'm going to get to where we own our house out outright. There's no mortgage. And if we reach this certain amount of net worth, then I will feel secure and provided for. Now, some of you, you've, you've said that same thing, and you've gotten there, and then you realize, I, I actually don't feel any more secure and provided for. I remember getting to that, those goals, wrecked my body and my health in the process, achieved them at age 31, and then felt emptier than I had ever felt before. I was depleted. I was so disappointed I had given everything to get these things, and I still didn't feel that acceptance that I was longing for or that security. I wonder in your life, if you're honest, have you ever felt something like that? Can you relate to the disappointment? Can you relate to the depletion? I wonder if you're honest, where are you exhausting yourself right now in your life in that fruitless search for something that's missing? Where, if you're honest, do you feel a little bit like this guy? The waters of life, if you're honest, are actually fairly calm. The family's healthy. The bills are paid. Life's okay. There's a roof over your head. But inside, you feel like this. I wonder if you'd be honest just between yourself and God. Where this past week or this past month, where have you been the most disappointed, the most let down? I would encourage you to open that area up to God even right now because those areas where we're the most disappointed are often kind of like a lid that if you'll open it, it connects down into your heart, into these deeper broken areas that we all have. Maybe you're incredibly disappointed by a family member where you sacrifice for them and you do all these things, but they won't show up and love you in the same way. Most likely under that lid, there's a need for connection that perhaps no other human can actually meet. If you're running after financial success or after uh, accolades, there's needs under there like I described in my life. We all have them. And I want to give you an insight today that I believe those wounds are actually the very starting point of you getting on a journey of a deeper relationship with God where you start to actually experience God in your daily life. That's what I'd like to share with you today. And it's this moving beyond just asking God to fix your problem, to fix the pain. Like a lot of times we look at the lid and we see the pain and it's like, just fix that pain. And what God's waiting is for you to say, fix me, not just the pain, but you can, everything under that lid, everything down into my heart, all the roots, all the brokenness, all the cavities and empty things inside me, God, I want to experience you in all those areas. That's really the question we're asking. If you could avoid that constant disappointment and depletion, would you want to know how? That's what we're going to learn from Scripture today. God, uh, at that season in my life where I hit that depression of just exhaustion, fatigue, and emptiness, he brought three different Bible-based books into my life. Now, if you were here back in August, I shared with you about one of them. It was a book called The Winning Attitude. And we did a series called The Bright Side. You're welcome to check that out on our website if you missed it. Uh, this is about how we view the world. I was raised as a perpetual pessimist. So God used that book to really lift my outlook. But the book I want to introduce to you today 
was a book that went much deeper, a book that is really about how you view yourself, a book that's really about your identity. And it's not an exaggeration to say that this next book I want to share with you, it, it changed me in a way that has changed my appetites and every domain of my life. Uh, here's what happened. I had this Toyota Land Cruiser at the time. We lived in the mountains, the high elevation pines there in Arizona. And there were all these logging trails around. They're just like two ruts through the woods that the logging trucks use. And I was so low... This, this book I'm about to show you was the first audio book I ever listened to, and I would put it on, and I would hop in my Land Cruiser, and I would just go out driving on these trails, some days driving with tears in my eyes, just for hours, wandering through the woods, sometimes too empty or too depleted to cry, and here's what started to happen slowly. Almost like when there's a stain on the carpet and it's just not coming up, but you keep spraying more cleaner and you keep scrubbing and you wonder, is this thing ever going to come up? And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's getting a little bit lighter, but I've got to keep working on it. Just like that, very slowly, the truth of who my father in heaven is, it started to make its way through the stains of my childhood, started to make its way through the stains of my own brokenness. And I started to not just believe that God is good, but for the first time in my life, I started to perceive and feel that he actually loves me as I am, that he actually cares about my life, that he'll actually meet my needs. That book is called Abba's Child. The word Abba is a word that you'll still hear in the Middle East, and it was used in Jesus' time in the same way that in our culture we would say Papa, or daddy. Abba's child is this idea that God the Father is not just a a stern figure in heaven, but as Jesus described him and as scripture presents him, he's a loving Abba, a papa, a daddy who wants to welcome you if you will have a faith like a child and he will meet your deepest needs. We've got this book available in the lobby at all our locations. You can also get it at cp.news. I highly recommend the audio version. I, I've re-listened to this every year uh, since that first year. I listened to it about five times that year. And I just keep re-listening to it once a year. Because what happened as I drove those mountain logging trails is I started to actually perceive I'm actually loved. I'm actually wanted. I'm actually pursued. I started to feel those things for the first time ever in my life from an authority figure, from someone who was above me. And I started to realize that when it came to my material desire for security, that I would actually never have enough until I started to experience my father as the one who gives my daily bread. And that he'll be there every day to provide what I need. That started a journey in my life. And it's what I want to invite you today. Would you right now just to God, say, God, I want to experience you as my Abba, my Papa, my Daddy. God, I want to experience you to meet my deepest needs. Because the reality is ever since you were a vulnerable little boy, a tender little girl, for all of us, there were unmet needs. And what we do is we compensate, we cope, we figure out some other way. If they're not going to see me, if I'm not going to get that in my family, then I'll go out here and I'll achieve and I'll get that somewhere else. And for you, it might be a totally different thing, but we all have these broken things. And if we don't deal with them, it makes it so hard on the people around us because we're walking through life dysfunctional where we're repeating these little cycles and they're unhealthy and, and it makes us less available to the people around us. Right now, you can call out to God and just say, God, I want you to complete whatever's missing in me. Here's how this journey continued for me. Over the years, as a result of reading that book and really just scripture in general, I realized that I needed to cultivate the skill of identifying what I lacked. So I gave you two examples. I lacked financial security and I lacked approval. I needed to identify those and then I needed to go to God the Father and say, God, I don't just want to know you in an intellectual sense. I need to experience you as my dad, a perfect dad, 
the one who meets my needs, the one who gives me approval and acceptance. Cultivating a skill is not, you know, commonly something that you're asked to do. We cultivate lots of skills when we're little, right? Someone teaches us how to tie our shoes. That one took me forever. I was like the slowest shoe tying kid. Someone taught us to brush our teeth. Someone taught us to ride a bike or to swim. In the same way, this is a skill that now as an adult, you can cultivate if you'll say, God, I want to learn this skill. I'm willing to put in some work. What is it that you're doing? What's the skill? It's having a a lifestyle where you pause either once a day or once a week and you say, what is it that's motivating me right now? What did I actually do with my day today? And why is it that I did that? Why is it that I wanted all that money? Or why is it that I wanted connection with that person who won't call me back or whatever it is? And then you trace that thing. You say, God, I I might not even be able to put words around it, but there's a need down there. And Father, I need you to meet that need. That's what we're talking about doing. If you're a believer in Jesus, the Holy Spirit can help you with this. This is the way that Jesus lived In John chapter 4, there's a story where he and the disciples, they wake up one day and they don't have any food. And the disciples are like, hey, we got to go to the market and get some food. And Jesus says this paradoxical, weird thing. He says, well, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. I can imagine Peter and the guys being like, okay, good. We're going to go get some bagels, you know, like good for you. Our stomachs are growling. What did Jesus mean? Well, food, what does it do? It meets your inner need. It sustains you. It energizes you. And what Jesus said in his words and what he models in his life is that it is God the Father, the the one creator and sustainer of the universe, who is actually the one who can meet your inner needs, who can actually sustain you when nothing else will, who can actually energize you when nothing else can. One of my favorite examples of Jesus teaching this is what's called the Lord's Prayer. And maybe you've heard it before. I'll walk through it really fast. Here's how it goes. It's Matthew 6. This is how Jesus teaches us to pray. By the way, it's a very short prayer. If you like short prayers, you and Jesus are on the same page, okay? He said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed or exalted be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. Father, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, our mistakes, our trespasses, just as we forgive those who've made mistakes against us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's a very short prayer. I had read that prayer many, many times, but It was after going through that book, Abba's Child, and starting to open the lids on some of those deeper needs in my life that the Holy Spirit, one day I was reading the Lord's Prayer, and it was this aha moment. This prayer is actually an on-ramp of you getting your needs to the Father. I'll show you that in just a moment here. But think of a highway. You know, the only proper way to get on is on the on-ramp. And really what Jesus, you'll see this as we walk through it, what Jesus is teaching you, it's less about memorizing these words. Some Christian traditions, maybe some of you as kids, you had to do that. And you have those words memorized, but they mean nothing to you. I don't think it matters that much if you memorize the words, but I think the principle of it is kind of life or death. If you really want to see God show up in your inner life, what Jesus is saying is every day bring your needs to the Father. Prayer is the on-ramp of saying, God, here's what I need. Because what does he ask for? I need bread. I need forgiveness. I need protection. It's very much a child to a parent saying, here's what I lack. Will you provide it for me? This is what the Lord's Prayer does. I'll walk you through these real quick. Not going to do long little sermons on each of these. But notice these needs that you and I have. They're universal. We all have a need for identity, don't we? Now, culture changes across centuries and generations. People, there was a time when they found their identity in their nation, nationalism. The time when people found great identity in their family. You know, I'm a Smith or I'm a whatever. Oh, you're part of, you know. People find identity in sports. I found my identity in an unhealthy way in achievement. Your identity, by the way, is not your gender. 
It's not your sexual attraction. It's not even how you feel. If you make your identity one of those things, you're going to be as empty as I was when I thought success could be my identity. Look at those, just those two words, our father, which when you're praying this individually, you're saying, God, you're my father. What Jesus is instructing us and modeling us, the on-ramp of your desires is saying, come to God every day with your need for an identity. Because whether you realize it or not, we're all marching through life trying to answer the question, who am I? And where do I belong? And Satan's got lots of places that will tell you you belong here and this is who you are that will actually lead you to, you know, fruitless living, empty living, hundreds of options. And so Jesus says, hey, believer, start your day every day or have a moment every day where you say, God, creator of the universe, thank you that through Jesus, I'm your child. That's who I am. Who I am is not my career. It's not my net worth. It's not my accomplishments. It's that the one true God of the universe loved me enough to die on a cross for me, and I'm in right relationship with him, and I will always belong in his family. And no matter what anyone says about me on the internet or in my workplace or how disappointed my relatives are with me or anything else, I have a good identity and I belong because of my father. And so in the same way, each little phrase of this short prayer actually, if you open your heart, goes down to those deep, deep caverns of your soul where you have unmet needs. The need for security and provision. Where is your father? He's in heaven. The idea here isn't that he's distant from you. The idea is that in the hierarchy of the universe, he sits at the control panel, at the dials and switches of all planets and galaxies and nations and eras. And your dad who loves you is over every situation that you'll face today. That brings safety and protection, doesn't it? That's what hollow would be your name. It means exalted. And so for me, I tend to do, run through this little prayer right before I go to bed at night because I'm kind of a night owl. And I, I don't typically recite the whole thing, but I'll grab a little phrase like that, my father, and I'll just say, God, where am I finding my identity today? Well, I thank you that I got to do that. That was fulfilling, but that's not my identity. These people said these nice things about me, but that's not my identity. I'm your son. Help me live like your son today. And you can do this same thing. This can become a habit in your life. God, I find my, who I am in you, and I find where I belong in you. God, you're in heaven, so I just thank you right now that you're over every nation that's at war. You're over both political parties. Good thing, because, I mean, goodness, you know, it's just, there's a lot of mess in this world, and I'm so glad you're above it, because otherwise, I'd have so much anxiety in my life. And you're hollow, and you're, you're going to win in the end, even if I see some temporary losses for what is right right now here's some other needs that you have you have a need for someone to listen to you don't you you have a need for someone to help you there's nothing wrong with reaching out to another person but if you never reach up to the father those people aren't going to actually fulfill you know some of us are wired toward achievement or material things to meet our needs others of you you're very wired on the relational level and if there's an unmet need in you, you're actually going to drive the people around you crazy because you're recalling and retexting all of them, hunting, searching for them to give you what they can't give you. And you can get that from the Father. This language, give me today, is actually command language. It would actually be a inappropriate phrase in the original language here, give me today my daily bread, would be inappropriate unless it was a family relationship. Uh, this is like, you know, when people order food, some are like, I'll have the salmon, please. And others are like, give me the salmon. This is the second one. And it's not typically in scripture how you pray to God. But remember, Jesus changed everything when he said, if you'll believe in me for your salvation, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to pay money for it. All you have to do is be humble enough to admit that you need my help. And if you'll receive that Jesus is God and he died on the cross for you and rose again, if you'll ask him to be your savior, you will be saved. You're made right with God. And when that happens, you get adopted into the family of God. So we're very familiar that it says our father, but for this culture at this time, no one thought of God as their father. That's only possible through Jesus. And this give me today what I need uh, really kind of 
demanding language is in the context of like a little toddler crawling up on the lap of their good grandpa and saying, Papa, give me some of your cookie. That's a lot different than a stranger saying, give me your cookie. One's a bully and one's endearing. And the point is this, God wants you to bring your needs to him. He wants you to look to him to fulfill your needs. And this goes way beyond your physical appetite. God, give me, give me, I have a need to connect with someone. I feel so lonely in life. Would you give me that connection? Bring him all your appetites. Bring him all your hungers. And then provision, daily bread. God, give me a mindset that I don't have to panic about tomorrow and next month and next year because as long as I have you, every day you're going to provide what I need. Here's some of these other deeper needs in this very short prayer. We all have a need for a hope and a future. Now, when life is, is great, and the sun is shining, and everyone's healthy, you might forget that you have a need for a hope and a future. But you will have moments in your life where you have a doctor's appointment, and it changes everything. I've been a journalist, and then now a pastor, and I've noticed that all of us think cancer will never happen to me. Well, I hate to tell you, someone in your family will have cancer between now and the time you get to heaven. It's just the statistics. We all think my family will never be touched by that. But then it comes for us, and everything changes. And all the things we had our hope in, our material goods, our, um, our reputation, all that stuff, all of a sudden it doesn't matter when the doctor tells you, you might have a year left. You need a hope for a future. It's part of being human in a world that's broken by sin. If you don't have a hope and a future, you don't really have anything. But you do through Jesus. You get to know that this world which is disposable isn't your ultimate home. And so when you pray, Father, my identity is in you, would your kingdom come? There's a kingdom where there's no death. There's a kingdom where there's no hospitals. There's a kingdom where there's no cancer. There's a kingdom where there's no tumors. There's a kingdom where there's no prisons. There's no crime. There's no locks on the door because there's no evil. There's no deceit. And we can so easily, even as Christians, get lured into thinking that our kingdom is here and now. It's not. So Jesus says, every day, remind yourself whose you are and who you are and remind yourself where your real hope and future is. It's in the kingdom of heaven. God, would your kingdom come to earth? Would your will, would your plan be done? Some of you always have a plan. Others of you never have a plan. You probably married someone who's the opposite of you on that. Even those of us who are control freaks, I'm one and I always have a plan. Guess what? My plan's not always the best plan. You know someone who always has a good plan. Even when you're up against a wall, you're at a dead end, there's no way forward, he has a plan. And praying your will be done is very simply saying, God, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, but you do. Would your plan be done in my life? On earth as it is in heaven... Why is it after you trust in Jesus, if you've been made right with God and now you get to experience eternal life, why don't you zip right up to heaven? Why do you have to stay down here in this world of wars and cancers and divorce and evil and racism and hatred? Why? Because just like Jesus, you are now in this world to be an agent, an activator of the kingdom of heaven on earth, to bring heaven to earth. That's what we get to do collectively as a church. So what each of you do every day as a follower of Jesus in your workplace, in your family, you're bringing heaven to earth. And when we pray very simply on earth as it is in heaven, it's a surrender to say, God, now I know who I am. I know that I'm safe. I know that you've got a plan. I know I've got a hope and a future. And what's my purpose today? It's not to just meet every appetite I have. It's not to just be safe. It's not to avoid pain. It's to join you in doing great things that bring your perfect kingdom into this broken world. We also all have a need for release from shame, release from guilt. We have this deep need to know I'm in right relationship with the people that matter to me. And if you didn't get that from your family of origin, there's no relationship humanly that will ever give you that. And by the way, every family of origin is broken, okay? So when Jesus says, every day when you pray, include these two little words, forgive me. 
I love this. Because, you know, there are a lot of buildings that have crosses on them that call themselves churches, but they no longer teach the pure, peaceful message of Jesus, which is that his work is what gets you right with God, not your work. And it's easy. There's a lot of, quote, churches that actually teach behavior modification. Do these things and don't do these things, and then you'll be a good Christian. Now, yes, we should seek to follow Jesus and look more like him every day, but... He tells us, you're probably going to need to ask for forgiveness every day of your life. And you know what? That's, that's kind of a weight off, isn't it? If you're, if you're seeking to live for God and you mess up, you just come back to him every day. Father, forgive me. And you can know every day that you're right with God. By the way, if you're here today and you don't know today that you're right with God, you can right now call out to Jesus to be your Savior in a life-changing way. Scripture says, if you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Simply declare that he's God. Declare your need for him, that you know you've sinned and messed up. Ask him to forgive your sins and invite you into the family of God. And if you do that, please tell someone around you. Tell whoever invited you or tell one of our pastors here after the service because there's a whole new world that has opened up for you the moment you do that. We also have a need to be in a, a great family Interesting, Jesus says to pray, forgive me my mistakes as I forgive those who've made mistakes against me. That's how he teaches us. That's how we're to live. And part of this is realizing, you know what, it might not be in my nature to forgive that person who wronged me. I could hold a grudge beyond my death. (laughs) Some of us have that in us. But what does our dad do? What does our family do? You've got a great family name to live up to. So when I pray through the Lord's Prayer, it's this reminder, God, not only do I need forgiveness every day, but if I'm going to be like you, Papa, Abba, Daddy, I'm going to need your help to make me like you in forgiving those people who didn't do right by me. Need for a protector, lead me not into temptation. Need for a rescuer, deliver me out of evil. Need to belong in a great family. Yours is the kingdom. The kingdom. It's this idea that even though this world is temporary, your dad in heaven already owns every acre of real estate. Every square foot of every building. People think they own it. They die. Their kids sell it. Their kids ruin themselves with all the money. And then someone else thinks they own it. And and it's just cycling through. He actually owns it all. It's his kingdom. Romans chapter 8 tells you that you are a co-heir with Christ. And so if you're a person like, like me from my childhood who operates from a scarcity mentality that you'll never have enough, you can actually look around at everything and realize your dad owns it all. And when you pray daily, Lord, my purpose on earth, your kingdom come, your will be done through me. He will give you exactly what you need every day to do his work on earth. This is how Jesus lived. He'd show up, people would feed him. He needs a donkey, oh, here's a guy with a donkey. Like, he just provides. He gives you what you need, and it changes your mindset from thinking, oh, I'm never going to have enough, to, wow, my dad owns it all. He's just a good dad who's not going to spoil me by giving me so much that I mess myself up. And I just got to trust him, that as I walk with him and I live for him every day, he'll meter out exactly what I need for today. Last need here is that he's more powerful than that unjust boss. Some of you, you've got a boss you report to. They're a liar. They're just pure evil. And you're like, why do I have to work for this person? Don't worry. Your your dad's over that. He's over every government. He's over every military. And the day will come when all people will see how good he is. Yours is the power and the glory. God is eager to meet your every need, but if you don't look to him, you'll find yourself drowning even when the water's calm, just like this guy. The water's calm, but he's not. And that's me any time, which I still do, that I start to look to meet my needs outside of God. So I wonder which of these two, the flailing kayaker or this next one, Which of these two best illustrates your life lately? They're both in calm water. And I don't mean your circumstances. 
Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So your circumstances can be a total storm, and you can be this calm inside through your relationship with God. Or vice versa, your circumstances could be clear sailing, and inside you're all turbulent. The Father that you have in heaven is the Father spoken of when Scripture says, the Lord is my shepherd. So I won't want for anything. He makes me lie down in green pastures. There's rest, there's food. He leads me beside quiet and still waters. That's your father. He wants you to experience that today. Well, again, if you want to join me on this journey, here's the book, Abba's Child. It's available in the lobby. We've got the link at cp.news. You can, as you start cultivating this skill you'll start to realize two or three or four areas of deep need in your life. And sometimes it takes years, but you'll start to realize, oh, that's why I'm always going after more of this. That's why I'm always looking for another relationship. That's why I'm never satisfied here. And then what you can start to do, and we can help you with this, is in the word of God, you find the correlating provision of God for that need. So it's almost like you're a puzzle piece and you have this cavity, this brokenness, and you find the promise of God for it and the puzzle pieces start to fit together and it starts to integrate and give you a secure inner identity regardless of your circumstances. Took me years of doing this. I've not arrived on it. But there was a day I was listening to a podcast by some pastor or author, I forget who it was, but he was talking about personal declarations And at first I thought, that sounds so weird. But then as I was praying later, I realized, you know, I know all these needs and I know these Bible verses that correlate to the needs. What if I just sit down and write out like, here's who I am. Uh, I have a son named Jack. And I thought, what if Jack was my age and I was older and he had the deep needs that I have? What would I tell him? So I'm going to show you just a little bit of my daily declarations. This won't be long. This isn't all of it, but you can see highlighted there, what is the first line? It asks this question, who am I? And then it says, I am an heir to the largest fortune in human history. Now, you might look at me like I'm crazy, but I genuinely believe that's true. And believing that is true these last 10 years of my life is totally changed. It's just totally changed the way I live, that I know that my father's always going to give me what I need as long as I'm pursuing his work in the world. The next highlighted line there says that I've been adopted into the family of God. By the way, I I could give you 10 scripture references for each of these, but these are just samples. I needed to know as as a youngest who was an accident and then was pretty much just an inconvenience for my family, I needed to know I, I have a father who wanted me, who sought me out, who checks in on me every day. The third highlighted line there says, I am always wanted. I'm always pursued, I'm always provided for, and I'm always accepted by my Father. If you've placed your faith in Christ, these are true of you. Now, you might have other deep internal needs. I just want to give you this as an example. You don't have to do this the same way. It might seem overwhelming, but the idea is this. It's the big idea. Cultivate the skill of identifying what you lack and then finding it in the Father. I just wanted to show you in my life what it looks like. Now, I'm not going to walk through these three phases in detail. Uh, I'll just kind of summarize it for you. Cultivating the skill, just ask God to help you with this. Make this a way of life. Make it something you do every day. Catch yourself when you get in those old feeding patterns. That's why my closest friends know I'm not allowed to check my book sales ranks. I'm just not allowed to because it's not healthy for me. I'll start to find my identity in that, and it's just not my best self. Identify what you lack is really just having those times daily or weekly where you kind of pause and you, you just reflect, like, what am I actually going after in life right now? And am I even asking the Father to provide that? You can ask the Holy Spirit to help you with that. You can also ask insightful people. Uh, some people in the body of Christ just have a, a gift to help you unpack your deeper needs. Most counselors and therapists have that gift. Third, then, find what you lack in the Father. So I'd encourage you, no one ever taught me to pray the Lord's Prayer every day, which maybe is good because I didn't have it as some hollow religious thing. But after I realized, oh, this is about my needs, that's now just when I go to bed at night, 
I just lay there and I just kind of go through those ideas. You're my father. You're over everything. It's about your kingdom. Help me be an agent for your kingdom. Lord, I've got a lot of appetites that are unmet. Give me my daily bread, etc. And then lastly, you can find specific Bible promises around the things that you need. And you can take a picture of this if you need. There's a website called gotquestions.org. Type in any of your needs in there, and it will lead you to great scriptures. And then these Life Application Study Bibles, this is about a $40 Bible that we'll give to you today for free if you'll read it, uh, because it's changed my life, it'll change your life, and it has in the back all sorts of topics you can look up. So you could look up achievement, relationships, success, money, whatever else. Okay. Earlier I showed you this contrast of the flailing kayaker. And then I showed you a serene, peaceful lake. But really the picture I should have shown should have been this one. If you look closely, there's actually two people in this kayak. There's a child in the front and a father in the back. This is how God actually wants you living your life. It's not that you're in the storm alone. You're not in the boat alone and just calling out to him for help. He's in the boat with you. This is what Jesus makes possible as a way of life. When God began teaching me these things I've shared with you today, I was 31 years old. But in my soul, there was still a little boy who had never been affirmed, who had never been approved of. And in God's plan, right at that age of my life, my son Jack was this age, that tender age where they will just look up to you with these eyes of like, I need you. Will you affirm me? Will you love me? Will you value me? Will you hug me? At that age, it's so healthy and normal for a child to see themselves as a dependent. When a child that age is on family vacation, they're not wondering, do we need to stop for gas? Where are we going to eat? I hope they thought of a hotel to stay at. All they need to know is mom and dad are here. Mom or dad is here. And that's where, that's where the father wants to get us back to. It's such a, a more peaceful way to live. But it's not how I was living and I would guess for most of us, Our whole adult life, we've never lived like that. Imagine the freedom you'd have in your life. Imagine the security you'd have. Imagine the connection and the rest you'd have if you would surrender to start saying, hey, as long as I've got the Father, all my needs are met. You can choose today to start being a dependent. God, I depend on you for my daily bread. I depend on you for my identity. I depend on you to protect me. Lord, I I can't find what I need in the people around me or the circumstances around me. Now, when Jack was that age, he and I would take a walk every day. We lived in the middle of a bunch of ranch land in Arizona, and this is what it looked like. We had a one-mile loop that we would walk every day. And when he was this size, you know, I'd take him outside. He'd run like 30 feet all out sprint, and then he'd just get exhausted. And he'd come back to me and He wouldn't even say, Dad, pick me up. He just had this signal. You know what the signal was? He'd just come to me and do that. I'd put my hands under his alarm pits and hoist him up and put him on my shoulders. Child psychologists write about this, that a healthy parent, they call it a scaffolding. The healthy parent is like the home base, and the healthy child goes out and explores the world, and they get stung by a bee, or they get scared, and then they run back. And they find that they're safe in their parent. And then they go a little further and they come back and they go a little further. That's a healthy development. And that's what Jack would do. He'd go out and found a rattlesnake skin and then he'd run back. And I'd pick him up. I'd pick him up like this picture here. Some days that, that mile loop, he'd be on my shoulders for three quarters of it. Some days he'd be on it for one tenth of it. It all depended on what kind of day he was having and what kind of things he was experiencing. But one thing that was always the same is there would be at least one point that he'd run to me and go like this. I wonder when's the last time have you ever gone to your creator? I need you. I have needs that aren't met anywhere outside of you. 
Would you pick me up? Would you do for me what I can't do for myself? He's the scaffolding to which you can always retreat. He's the only one who can meet your deepest needs. Your creator wants to love you like this. A healthy dad with a healthy boy or girl. And just you knowing that when you're in his arms, when you're close to him, it doesn't matter if you have to sit in an MRI tube for a while. It's okay if you have to go to a funeral. When the house feels empty, when you feel alone, when your body aches and wears out in this broken world, he's there. And you find in him a security and acceptance, a provision that no one else and nothing else can give. I'd love to pray that for you right now if you'd just stand together with me. Father, I pray right now. I pray for every single person in this moment. You see them. Some are in other states. Some are at other locations. Many of us here. God, you see every disease. You see every heartache. You see every shame and guilt. Lord, you see the person who walked into this moment so lonely. You see the person who's so broken. You see the person who's without hope. Almighty God, we thank you that through the real person of Jesus, we got to see you in human form. And you say, come to me, all you who are weary and broken and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Rest for your souls. So, Father, we open up the lids and the compartments to the deepest caverns of our souls today. May we experience you as our Abba, as our Daddy, as our Papa. Lord, where we've looked to other things to give us security or accolades or approval or connection, we now look to you. And God, we pray that you'd make us more like Jesus, that we would make it our food to find all our needs met in you every single day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So good. Our hearts respond in worship. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go, and I see. Father again and again and again 
they can come on he's a good father he's a good good father just remember that you're loved that you never forgotten that god that you never alone that god's for you he's with you through it all it's been a great time guys from uh, church today go ahead have a great week and we'll see you soon love you guys Bye -bye.